Hello, and welcome to the Bluff Creek Project Podcast. I'm Tate Hieronymus. I'm your host. And today on In the Field, we have Ranger Robert Leiterman interviewing James Bobo Fay. So without further ado, let's listen to James Bobo Fay. This canyon wall carries my tomb. The only one to hear my song. Are the coyotes and the wolves But if I drink enough of this flask I can hear them sing your song too This is Robert Leiterman here, the Bluff Creek Project. I'm sitting here with Bull Bull Fay. And uh, we had interviewed Bart earlier, and we're, we've been out. Ooh. We've been out here for pretty much about three days. Uh, it was a great getaway. We've been sequestered at our homes for the last three months, and it's, we finally got a good chance to get out. We all decided to come here and meet. You know, we did the mass thing. We traveled to get here, and uh, we're seeing at one of the lakes in Six Rivers National Forest. And right now, it's God, where is it? Like about nine fifty, nine thirty. Yeah. And it's it's gorgeous. The moon is uh, almost a half, and it's right above this lake we're sitting next to. Uh, we had a great sunset, and uh, we had red skies at night. Sailor's delight was pretty good. You can still hear a little bit of wind blowing, so we have a sock on our thing. We're trying to make sure we don't get too much wind going on. But it's been great. And uh, Bart is over in the kitchen. He's still going to make us some dinner, so you might hear some, some dinner noise in the background. That's just Bart. He's been doing a lot of cooking the last few days, and he's an awesome cook. Oh, yeah. And chef. Chef, rather. He's an awesome chef, and I don't see him think, take things out of cans. He pretty much cooks it all up, great sauces. Well, he used cans. The essence yeah, of it. I don't know, tomatoes. Give me a break. Your grandma Catito's rolled in her grave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's going to make dinner right here. We're going to squeeze our little interview in. So I scratched a bunch of notes, but it's dark. You can't see this. But, you know, we're going to work from there. But I've known Bart for, gosh, since uh, since 2005. And I've known Bobo since 1999. Yeah. yeah that whole was a different century. Yeah. Was whole it a different millennium. Yeah. It'd be like the, <laughs> 20, the what, the, the 20th century? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I didn't know much about about uh, Bobo doing the squatching thing. But I, I got a phone call about... Um, Probably, uh, probably December-ish. I'm trying to remember. In 1999, I got this call, and, it, and this, this this dude answers, you know, calls me up, and he says, "Hey, uh, it's, 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 uh, my name is Bobo, Bobo Fay, and I, uh, and, uh, and I heard you're in the Bigfoot, and uh, you, you must be the the Bigfoot Ranger. So is that what you first said to me? I don't know. Probably something like that. Yeah, I remember that. It's it, coherent, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was when we first met. We first got got finding about the Bigfoot stuff. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been kind of a, a nice little journey here. And, and um, you saw the article that I wrote a long mm-hmm. time ago. That was a that was back. That was back in 1999. There was a, a Sasquatch sighting or an alleged Sasquatch sighting at Humboldt Redwood State Park. That's when I first discovered the internet. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, I didn't have a computer or nothing or dial up or any of that stuff but my buddy did and I stayed at his house for two weeks straight and went through just as many reports as I could find on the BFRO like the whole west coast there wasn't that many reports back then but so I could go through the whole database I ended up going through every report in the whole database over the next year and a half was that the BFRO database yeah yeah this is before you met Matt this is before yeah you were I, uh Freddie's got me a Fred just got me a. Oh no, that I wasn't in the flats. I was just published reports. Okay, started. published reports. Then, I got, then when I got into the flats, that's when I went really hog crazy. Yeah, then that's there was way more. So you met John Freitas uh, before? I hadn't met him yet. We just were talking on the phone. I call, I saw him in the San Francisco Chronicle and I called him. That's right. There was an article about his cabin, right? Yeah. And the bear or something else. He had a cabin up in uh, Delaware County. Yeah, he was up on Little Jones. Yeah. Up there. And I, I knew that area real well. And I was like, God, I probably know which house because I've been up there so much. I knew, I knew right. all the cabins along the road. He's like, I'm the brown two story cabin. And I was like, I knew right where he was. Because I didn't get to meet John Freitas till September, Labor Day weekend at Humboldt Redwood State Park. So John Freitas shows up. Uh, 
on the uh, Liberty weekend in September, early September, and he he he, he heard that I was you know into Bigfoot stuff. So, so he kind of looked me up, introduced himself, and he had this pickup truck with a big old shift speaker on the back. Yeah. And he asked me, he goes, um, I do call blasting. I go, what, what, the, what the heck is call blasting? And he goes, well, you know, we have the ledge Bigfoot sounds, and we just blast them into the, you know, the wilderness to see I can try to get a return call. Yeah. But working for the parks, and we have endangered species like the marble mirrorlets or the spotted owls, and that's during the nesting period. And, I, and the answer was, no, you can't go around the park on the busiest day of the year and blast sec, uh, ledge Bigfoot calls into the you know, park. This is not going to work. But he told me that they they were following up on a report, and it was it was a grasshopper, grasshopper peak report, yeah. and and that was back in uh, August to 20, 23rd of nineteen ninety nine, so it wasn't until like uh, September twenty third of nineteen ninety nine that I finally got up to go take a look at that and investigate it, because as a park ranger, you really don't take reports for alleged Bigfoot reports. We, we just don't do that. And it was kind of frowned upon to start start that up. So I, I just thought I'd go check it out. So based on a photograph, I got another park aide with me to go look. We found the place. We went up there, found a cigarette bud, found a uh, strap to a camera. And then we started investigating it. We found the stump they talked about, but it wasn't quite exactly how they interpreted it. The report was a, uh, an older gentleman with his kid. Kid's shoe was untied. They were walking the river trail. He stopped. His kid tied the shoe. He looked up and saw what looked like a Sasquatch waist up, pacing back and forth, and then scratches back on a, what he said it was a stump. Well, when I looked up there and investigated, there was a burned out stump that had moss growing on it, but you could scratch the moss off, so it definitely wasn't, oh, thanks, wasn't quite right. And anyhow, so... One thing, one thing led to another, and uh, I, brought, I did a write-up of what we did, and then the next thing you know, I, I, I got this guy named Matt Moneymaker <laughs> calling me up and said, hey, uh, I saw Robert, you. Yeah. Matt Moneymaker here. <laughs> <laughs> I read your thing, and, and uh, yeah, I, how would you like to be a curator for the BFRO? It's like, uh, uh, or what? The, or the other one with, the other one with Chilo. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, yeah, I guess I could become a curator. What do you do? Well, you follow up on reports, and you go, okay, I'll do that. So that was like 2000, well, 1999 into 2000. Listen, I need you to go hike that trail right now. I know it's the middle of the night, but get up there right now. I want you to do some measurements for me. And get back to me first thing in the morning. Pronto. So when did you get involved with the BFRO? I think I got my password in 2000. I think that's what it was. And then I became uh, a vol- then I was a volunteer. Then I got to be an investigator in like 2003. So were you a an apprentice? Whatever they I can't remember what they called it back then. Something like that. It was like low level, whatever it was. And were you allowed to do any of the research to check in on to follow up on the reports? Oh, what, no. what was your job? No. Uh, <laughs> What was your job back in that? Be a flunky. <laughs> to go to the BFR investigator and That's learn the ropes. Oh, so you were supposed to find a BFR investigator and work with them and while they had access to the flat system. Right. Yeah. That was it. And when did you get... Is that, is that why you called me up? You wanted access? No. Uh, remember I called you up to say, let's... I said, hey, I want to go... I told you about how I made that cast that fell apart. I said, we should go practice casting because I had a bunch of casting material. That was a part of our, our great friendship. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, yeah, I was like, hey, let's go you know, practice casting. You were pretty standoffish. You're, 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 that's what you're still in your dickhead cop mode. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of part of the job in a way. Yeah, I don't blame you. Some long-haired freak calling you out of the blue, saying let's go cast mythical <laughs> creature footprints. It's like, who the hell is this? And so in 2003, you got to, you got to follow up on, on reports for the BFRO. Yeah. And I also think here, in uh, yeah, actually in 2003, that that was the big, uh, the the big confusion of funding the film site too. And you were you were there in in the 2003, the uh, the big. I knew where it was. Yeah, because actually in 2000 and 2004, I think I had our first trip together. Because you took I, me and my I had two, two of my boys. Uh huh. You we had you and he had uh, the Yams was there. Oh yeah. And uh, um, Osborne, David Osborne was mm-hmm. there too with his kid. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I got to actually go do things with you. I think I was the first. That's the first time? time. I think it was. So we ended up at Fish Lake, 
yeah. And we got all set up in the Fish Lake, and you had lots of stories. And and you, what you guys did is you kind of toured me around because at that point, I I, I was so skeptical. Yeah, I was so skeptical. I was familiar with the Bigfoot phenomena, and all the stories of Ape Cave and all you know. Uh, Ape uh, Canyon. Uh, yeah, I, I was familiar with those things, but I wasn't familiar with the film site. Mm. For me, it was just another cult place that people go at certain time of year to do whatever. So, right. so we got to see some tree breaks. I don't think they were tree breaks, but you know, yams and stuff. Talking about tree breaks, and then you, you you took us all the way down to where you used to be able to drive all the way down to the right, Peter Burns site. Yeah, where the bat box is, the upper bat box. So we parked there, and that's where um, yams told me about you know the Peter Burns site, and then you said I think it's farther upstream yeah and so you took me and my two boys upstream but we never made it we made it to the gulch because my kids didn't want to get wet right and how many kids you know don't want to get wet i know we should have made them go through the water do it anyway if you were a good dad we would have yeah we should just go i don't care <laughs> we could have carried them across so we as far as we got that was my first exposure to heading towards the film site in 2003 no, that was 2004. But going back to 2003, um, you actually went Sunday with everybody, right? Out of the film site? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and a lot of them were, were kind of confused, and they were hanging around the Peter Burns site and the Gulch. Right. But did you go down s upstream with um, Bob Gimlin? Yeah. And you walked all the way up to the De Hendon's Axe area. Yeah. And what did Gimlin say? He, uh, he was looking around. We were shooting Mysterious Encounters. That, so, that was filmed later though, right? No, that was filmed then. Okay. So we uh, we were uh, filming, so I was, I was trying to stay out of the camera shot because I was working behind the camera. Yeah. I was hired to whatever be a PA, local fixer guy like Rowdy does. Yeah. And uh, that was pre-Rowdy days. And because um, obviously he's the best at that. Yeah, he's good at that. So it was me, Dmitry Bainov, John Green, Gimlin, Dan Perez, John Bindernagle, Freitas, Moneymaker, uh, I think Kathy and Bob Strain, mm -hmm. and there's a couple other people there. I, didn't, I can't remember exactly all who now, but that was that was the core of it right there. How many people would you say were parked down there at, at that, that on the on the 2003? I, oh, and Autumn, yeah, Autumn Williams was there, of course. That's right, she, she, was, she was in this series. Yeah, because that's when Bob, um, I'd never met Gimlin before that day. Right, first time meeting Gimlin. Yes, yeah, so that was the first time I met Gimlin, and i just never forget, I think he was 72 or something like that, wearing cowboy boots on those slick, cobbled rocks. And he picks up Autumn, and she didn't want to get wet, and he jumped across the creek with her in his arms. He okay. cleared the creek, and then set her down. Such a gentleman he is. Yeah, oh, God. I was like, this guy's the man. <laughs> I always heard he was a total badass. I met the guy. I was like, this guy's the greatest guy ever. And there's, a, there's a famous photo of, of uh, Dan Perez and Binder Noggle. Mel, yeah, Meldrum was there. Meldrum, yeah, Meldrum's in the shot, yeah. John Green, Bynov. And I'm the actually the guy took that photo. You're the guy who took that photo? Yeah, I took all the photos. So I was, if you notice, if you look at the photo, too, like I'm taller than everyone else. In terms like, of the angle of yeah, the, the angle shot. Of, yeah. <laughs> And that was at the, the bat box, right? I don't know exactly where, but probably. Cause yeah. I, don't think, I don't think everyone made it to the films. I don't know if everyone made it up there. No, some people, so what I heard, I wasn't there. I was only there on Friday. Yeah, I, think, I think some people didn't make it. Yeah, it's, and so they hung mostly around the bat box area. Or not, maybe, maybe. No, we went up there. We went up and filmed with Bob up there. And then Bob's memory really started getting jogged. And I said, yeah, Bob, well, that, I think that's, and he's all, yeah, that is it. And then he started really getting into it. He's like, and we walked up, we walked up the bowling alley. Then he really started just flooding back when we walked up the bowling alley. He's like, yeah, this is where, and then she, her wet tracks crossed here, and this is where she went up the mountain, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you guys didn't go into the, the upper sandbar. You guys, because it's overgrown, it's hard to see anything. You guys were pretty we were much- down, down low. Yeah. He was well, pointing into the trees. Okay, cool. God, I wish I could have been there that day. I, I had to work. I could only be there on Friday, and I had to go back to work. Did Strufford go down there that day? You know, I don't know. He might have came with us, actually. I don't know. There was a few people I didn't know that were... Because he said he was there in 2003 at the... when there was Conference. That, yeah, at the conference. I was there Friday. I, I don't remember him there. I remember I got to meet Green in person that day. I got to talk to some quality time with um, 
uh, Christopher Murphy up the top of oh, the bleachers. Oh, yeah, yeah, Christopher Murphy, he was there. And I got to see uh, Bob Gimlin at a distance. He was the guy, the cowboy. And I remember, I didn't know that was him. It was like, who's that guy? Oh, well, he's the guy that was on with the Roger. He was the guy on the horse. Yeah. So that was pretty good. So so when you're walking down there, and uh, what what exactly did he say? What exactly did, did Bob say when you got to about the Dehenden's ex? And I know I know you know where that is. Yeah, he was. He it had been at that point in time like thirty five years or something like that. So I mean, but Bob's got a great memory. He's a smart dude. He's he's uh, he started bringing out details and he said that this is. Well, then I saw Roger was running that way, and then I rode up this way, and then I crossed the creek here, and that's when she turned and hackled up at me. Mm-hmm. And he was just kind of, you know, doing the same. But it was, it was, in the, I think it was all in the show, the TV show. Good. I, I, I can't remember. It's been a while since I saw it. Yeah. Um, but it was, aw- it was, it was awesome, man. Having like Dmitry Bynov, John Green, John Bindernagel, Jeff Meldrum. I was just like, damn, these guys, like, they're full heroes. I was like, like, because I, I lived down in L.A. before, mm-hmm. so I've been around celebrities. I could give a shit about them. Right. And I was like, oh, you hit a ball, you throw a ball in a hole, big deal. You catch a <laughs> ball, who gives a shit? I was like, these guys are squatchers, man. This yeah. is a real deal. Like, you talk about the four horsemen. I mean, John Green, I guess, was the only one that was there, but I mean, I'd throw Dmitry Bynov in there. I mean, that guy was, I mean, you had John Green... Uh, See, yeah, Bender Noggle. I mean, he's contributed more than a lot of. Uh, just those guys were, they were at the four. I mean, it wasn't like Renee was there and Krantz, right, or Byrne, but um, they were passed away by then. So yeah, those two were. Yeah. So it was a, uh, it was definite hero worship for me. And then Bob was so cool. Like I hit it off good with him, and I hit it off really good with Dmitry Bayanov. Then Meldrum took a while to warm up to me. He was never like unfriendly or anything, right. But, He's just like, fuck this guy. Who is this guy? What's yeah. he doing here? Yeah, exactly. Are you, are you, are you the valet? You're going to park my car for me? Well, plus the guy I, was with, uh, I went up there with to go check stuff out was my buddy Al Boy. I don't know if I I'm, no yeah, I think he met it. He's covered head to toe in tattoos. Maybe I did. Like, he looks like a total criminal. Like, he look, if you looked at him, you'd think he just came straight out of prison. But he's not. He's actually a good... He's 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 good, bro. He's, he's hilarious. But anyways... He was sketchy looking. I was kind of sketchy looking. And, uh, but yeah, so anyways, it worked out. Bob was cool with me. Bob, of all those guys, Dimitri. And I filmed with Dimitri for a week that week we were filming. Right. So I spent a week with Dimitri Bynow. That was awesome. He's a good buddy. I'm, I'm bummed he just died two weeks ago. Yeah, I remember I've seen that, seen that pop up. Yeah, he was freaking smart, man. He he was right on, too, a bunch of stuff. He's, his ideas about the hominins. And, mm-hmm. um, or, no, he was... He, I think he was the one that took it from hominid to hominin, for the squatch. I think, I think that was, yeah, that's what he did. He was, the, he was the first person to suggest that, like in in writing. Yeah, there's, there's, a, I mean, there's so much stuff. Yeah. I mean, you got to be there in 2003, and I, I didn't know where the film site was 2003. You got to be there. You got to see all these guys, and you had the connection. You knew what the, the importance these guys had for this place. Yeah, because. Um, I think Danny, Danny thought it was there too, but I, he wasn't there when we first got there, so like that's why I had to show everyone where it was. Because mm. he seemed a little confused. Cause, yeah, he, yeah. He, I, he, I thought he, because I was thinking like, because when he asked, he goes, he pulled me this, yeah, Danny pulled me this side and goes, are you sure about this? And I said, <laughs> I did, I go, when I first came here in like 88, you, you know, you could see it wasn't totally clear, but yeah. you could see better. I said, I said, well, I, when I came here, Fifteen years ago, the, this was. It looked more like the spot I've always. I just always thought this was the spot that looks like it to me. And then Bob was like, when we walked up there, and then he, he was like, yeah. And then this. And then we walked. When we walked up the bowling alley, he looked back. And he goes, yeah. This is it. So. Hundred percent. So going back to this spot really helped his memory with that. Oh yeah, yeah. He totally did. So was that the first time since the filming he'd been there? Yeah. Yeah. That that's pretty cool. Because uh, I really wish I could have been there for that Saturday and for the Sunday field trip. But, yeah. Uh, and you know what else happened that trip was uh, Meldrum heard his first, probably for sure, squash vocalization. In, in, over in, in Bluff? In Hoopa. Oh, in Hoopa. We went down um, where that one had jumped over the berry pit, the fence full of berries. 
like a five foot high or six foot high fence. It just jumped over it and ran off. And the tracks were down on the sandbar. Jump. It ran into the Trinity River and swam across. Yeah. Right where it swam across, the tracks were, shoot, six, eight days old, something like that. We were over there, and there was a chainsaw fire up across the river, and it's at the very edge of no man's land between Yurok and Hoopa Reses. Right, it's still, right, right. It's still yeah. Hoopa, but... Yeah. And uh, we were down there. As soon as we started poking around the tracks, we got screamed at from across the river, just the loudest. Just But there was a chainsaw running probably only 100 yards away from it. And the scream came probably 200 yards from us. So it was like, we were here... Here's a river, mm -hmm. chainsaw, scream, just wow. and Meldrum's eyes got all big. And the tracks at that point had lost all definition. Right, they were old, just older tracks. But you can see the the size and the distance between the step. I saw it because it ran. It was like eight, ten foot step. And and uh, who was all with you when when you when you did that? It was like me, Jeff, Dimitri. The film crew and Moneymaker. So this is part. This is part of the series, not. Yeah, that was part of. The, yeah, this this isn't the uh, the, the event. The well, it was the same weekend. Oh, the same weekend, though. Okay. I think when we were on the way when we were on the way to Bluff is when the scream happened. That's pretty cool. By that time, you you've had it. You've already had it, uh, encounters yourself. Yeah, yeah. I had. I had um, at that point, I already had three sightings. Yeah, I, I think we talked a little earlier. You, your, your your first sighting was what? Two thousand one. Two thousand one. May twenty six. You want to talk about that? Talk not too much. Okay. I'll talk about that ad nauseum. <laughs> okay, we, we'll pass on that one. Anyone that knows it has not heard that ten times. Okay, we'll pass I'll on that. Just give it a quick rundown. Yeah, that's fine. It was due west of Bluff Creek on the other side of the Klamath, up on Bald Hills. I was on Johnson Road. Um, John Freitas had called him at the message and it was when cell phones were like super janky, that like really yeah. terrible service. Yeah. And the message came in all broken up. But all I heard was Bald Hills Road, two to three miles down, there's a half moon, meadow on the right. I knew exactly I knew exactly what, I knew exactly where it was. And he said, Yeah, today or whatever and then I so I ripped up there and then I, I didn't find, when I called him the next day I found out it was a year ago today. That the woman saw it. Oh, you thought it was pretty fresh. So I thought it was that day, so I yeah. ripped up there and I actually at first had driven down to Southern Humboldt, down to my buddies at Myers Flat, borrowed his night vision scope, drove back up there, got up there about 7:30, um, something like that. Because I know, that, no, I got there at seven, and the and I started making noise right away. Or maybe I got there at 6:45 or something. Looked around. No, because I yeah I didn't just settle down. I I I got there earlier than that because I, I looked around for quite a at least an hour or two hours poking around for tracks and couldn't see anything fresh, just bear and you know deer and elk, a lot of elk up there. And but didn't, nothing that looked like a squatch trackway. So I sat. I started just ripping out. Huge, that was before I blew my vocal cords out when I started to do super loud calls. Yeah, I remember your, some of your calls. Oh, dude, I could do them loud. Yeah, my idol when it comes to that. <laughs> I, I was. I mean, I'm a shell of my former self now. But <laughs> it sucks. But anyways, I was doing the loud. I remember going like these are the loudest calls I've ever done. Mm -hmm. They were echoing all the way from Johnson Road down to the Klamath. Cause I've been there and that before. Yeah, you've taken. She, you actually taken me there before. Yeah. And yeah. It, it um so the first uh, the 21st was the encounter which to me was more gnarly than the sighting by far because i just got terrorized they were around there was at least two of them around me i think three pretty sure there was three um for sure two they were just super aggro tearing branches and yelling and screaming and shaking trees and roaring and chest beating all that stuff big loud huffs and so i was like Ooh, it would go Ooh, and then go at the end like a horse flap its lips <laughs> that's kind of different yeah and while it was smacking stuff and breaking things and it shook a trees I mean I don't see any trees I mean well bigger than, bigger than those and smart and those those look like about a foot and a half diameter it was dude it was taking yeah 14 yeah 14 16 18 inch trees and shaking the shit out of them that's, 70 foot tall that's pretty hard strong woods. that's pretty hard strong hardwoods deciduous trees just shaking them and um, I was so freaked out and it 
Well, this is my whoop story, one of them, is that Randy, I, when uh, the battery went out, when I was adjusting the knobs, I didn't realize I was loosening the battery compartment because they're all the same knob style. There's an old Ukrainian night scope from like the early 90s. The second I lost connection to the battery and the unit died, it just, the little green indicator went off. Yeah. The second that happened, the big one screamed and they instantly charged me. And you have no recording of this because it didn't no. wasn't working. I didn't have anything with me. I just had a night scope. Or a therm. Imagine having those tools then. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, it probably wouldn't have come out because it didn't come out until there was no electrical. Mm. And it was it was within less than two seconds from when the thing died to the screaming the charge. I ran across that meadow in seconds. Then I heard the rustling behind me. I'll never forget I had a wind up camera with a flash, a disposable cardboard kind of drop off it. You know, whatever the photo mat and go pick it up later. Yeah, old style, pre digital. I had one of those. I had a machete laying next to me. I was sitting in a chair, a plastic chair, like little, whatever patio plastic chair, sitting set back in the brush on like this. Then I had a um, oh, I had a uh, spotlight too, but I didn't want to use it right in you know? the show. Yeah. So, but um, and then all of a sudden I heard rustling behind me. I thought, well, that's weird. Like, because I was like, I guess they're just gone. But I was like, well, they, they couldn't have gone by the truck because my dog would have flipped out. Mm -hmm. He did that big pit bull. Yeah. And I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I heard rustling. And all of a sudden the rustling turns into a growl. And I start to look, and the growl just goes, Whoa. and it just. And I was like, oh, shit. And the growls started getting louder and louder. It was coming from way up in the air, like like where a basketball rim would be. Right. Right down, hitting me between the legs and all of a sudden, my shoulder blades. And it felt like an electrical beam was, like a laser beam was hitting me between my shoulder blades and the back of my neck. And just, I just remember like, shit, it just started making me, my eyes start watering more. And I was like, okay, it's, all right, Bose, get, get a control yourself, get control yourself. Because I was always taught that they were cannibals and would oh, kill you and stuff like that. That doesn't sound like a good good way to be at the end of that one. Yeah, so I was pretty nervous. When it was behind me, I was scared. Would you think that was infrasound? Would you classify I think, that? I think it was because the, the lower the growl got, yeah. the deeper the growl got, it, the lower it got, the more I got that feeling. And then the growl went away, but the feeling got stronger. Hmm. Like it lowered it down to hit infrasound, I think. And uh, was my, it? My eyes were, my arms were shaking really bad. My eyes were just pouring water, and I was hyperventilating. I couldn't breathe right. Yeah, oh, bodily. Just, you, you didn't soil your pants, did you, that day? No, no. Oh, my goodness. I probably could have, though. Because <laughs> I remember my eyes, and I was all wobbly, and I was like, I'd never experienced that before. Because when I ran out, I almost got Joe poked right there. I got poked right here mm -hmm. by an oak. There was, I went by a slash pile, and. Uh, oak branch was sticking out in the dark and it got me right just like a half inch from my eyeball uh, it's it's you're lucky then yeah drove down got back to my truck i thought my dog was gone I, I was faced north and i needed to turn south to get back to the road there was nowhere to turn around right there so i drove down the hill for like a couple hundred yards or whatever and i was like i drove fast Whomp! my dog had tore out the behind the had tore out the behind the dashboard like all the heating and cooling and all that shit. Trying to there. hide? Trying to hide. It yeah. showed his head and shoulders up in there. So they'd come by the truck and menaced him. I didn't even look for trash. On it. When I came up the next day, all the logging trucks had already come through, so there's no dust impressions or anything. Now, was it, was it five days later you were with Freitas? Yeah, five days later. Yeah, to tell me about that one. I, I know you told me before, but I'd, I'd like to hear it again. You were with Freitas. He was well, directing you in or something. I was meeting him. I met and Manny. Manny was my field partner after that for a couple of years. He unfortunately passed away. The Assassinino. He was out of Grants Pass. Great guy. Mm. Was, sus, I can't ever say it right. Sacedo. Um, he was Freitas' partner. And then I hooked up with him. And Freitas was busy, you know, married, full-time job, and blah, blah, blah. So Manny was... He was married and had kids too, but he would take off and go squatching more often. He, he had a kind of more of a lifestyle he could do that. So Manny and, and this guy, Jim, I think he was a probation officer from up there in Crescent City. I think he, Jim was with us. Hmm. Jim Hoops or Hooper? I think Jim Hoops. It might have been Hooper. Anyways, cool guy. Um, he used to was, go out with John. I went out with him a few times, early 2000s. And then I'd forgot the night scope back in my house. I called my buddy E.H. and he was going surfing up at Klamath that, we, that later that 
he was in a camp up there, so I knew he was going to drive by. Not right by there, because it was like 45 minutes out mm -hmm. of the way, but I called him and said, hey, man, I forgot my... Can you bring it up to me and you hang out? We'll have a little grub and do some squatching with us. And uh, so he brought it up there, and I said, yeah, man. And I was looking around, and we heard a scream come from down at the Clowns. We were like 2,000 feet. We were, I think we were at 2,500 feet, or... Yeah, we were about 20... We were around 2,300 feet or something like that. We heard a <clears throat> call come from down at the bottom below. It's like cliffs. It's really steep, rugged terrain full of yeah. cliff, uh, caves and shit. It's real gnarly. And that thing, we heard a scream from down below, from down at, um, like, Johnson's area. And uh, actually, it would have been more like... Between Johnson's and... Um, God, what's the last little village before you get the 169 ends? Right there, the bridge... I, 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 you and I have been there before. I can't even think of the you name come of it. The, you come south of Witchback. Yeah, all the way in the road ends there. We went to where that yeah, bridge yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it came from somewhere between there and Johnson's. The scream, like full Sasquatch scream. Everybody's like, no way. Like, dude, that's, that's freaking, that's one of them for 100% sure. So I, I was looking around and those guys were super loud and like making noise and stuff because they were, they were call blasting. They had Freitas' call blaster set up. The sheep, ship speakers in the yeah, back. Yeah, it was a World War II uh, destroyer's ship's horn. For that's, like, I met that one. All hands on deck. Yeah, that's a big speaker. Yep, and so we, uh, he was doing a show, a live radio show with Jeff Rance from the show Sightings, which at the time was like the seventh biggest radio show in the world, English-speaking radio show in the world. And so it was like a big, he had like millions of listeners and, so we're, we're sitting up there, and I'm like, with my buddy Eric, he'd brought the night scope up, and we're sitting there, and we're, he's there for 20 minutes, maybe something like that, and Freitas is on the phone with Jeff Ranson, he's like, hey, there's a bear growling at me. We're like, oh, cool, and I'm looking down, because it was a clear cut. Okay, so as you drive north, you're on the ridgeline, right? Right. And we're on the east side of the peak, but just by like 100, 200 yards at the most. From, so if you go 100 yards to the west, you're at the peak, and it drops, slopes all the way down to the ocean, like 15 miles away. To the east of us, it was like pretty much sheer drops. And, but we were on the east, just over the hill on the east side flank of the north-south running ridge. As you're driving north, you come into the clear cut on your left, but on your right was real fresh regrowth, like just several years old pecker poles. Just never yeah, like a kind out. of second growth. They cut it over, it's growing like back. fourth growth or something. Fourth, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was small, scraggly stuff. But they left the original trees from the hoopa trail that goes from Hoopa to the coast where the coast you're actually train with the Hoopas. Mm -hmm. So that trail still had big trees. They're not allowed to cut it. It had been cut originally but not the second growth cut that had happened like whatever, like 50 years ago, whatever it was. So there were some big trees that came up through those pecker poles and a few of those big trees went through the clear cut and then back up into the trees until it went up into the national park. And um, I'm looking down there and John's all, there's a bear ground, there's a bear ground on me. And I'm looking down there. So as you drive it on your left, it's a clear cut that goes uphill like another 100 yards or yeah. whatever, 50 yards, I can't remember nowadays. Then on your right, you're going through this pecker poles for about 100 yards maybe. And then it stops so like, there's pecker poles like 15 feet off the road parallel on you all the way down then they stop you're on clear cut on both sides now and we were parked right at that corner eric and i and our trucks were parked there manny and jim and john were parked down where they were call blasting at this little spur road we were parked on the main logging road johnson's road and uh john was saying something was growling and stomping its feet at him a bear was stomping its feet and i look and i'm looking and i'm looking and finally i'm looking and I'm, i remember thinking like how did I miss that giant burnt stump next to my truck? Mm -hmm. The one you parked next to. Yeah. And I'm like, because I got there in the daylight. There was no stump. And I was like, <laughs> but you don't, you don't think that. You're no. Thinking like, there's, I, how did I miss that? And all of a sudden, the stump stood up, turned, and walked into the tree line. That's freaking weird. That's when I just went, oh, my God. I mean, anyone that knows anything about night optics, there was a Gen 2 night scope at 120 yards. So it wasn't like the greatest look. It was just no. a little blocky. It was just enough to see what it wasn't. It was enough to see that it was huge, upright, never went down on all fours, broad, wide shoulders. It wasn't like one of those real V-dot. I think those super V-dot ones are the younger ones. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like the studly, like late teens, early 20s, early 30s guys that are all jacked up in shape. Yeah, and then they this get the middle was, bulge. This thing was just bulky from top to bottom. Like, a, it just looked like a shit brick house. It's a giant freaking monkey. That's what I said to him. I go, 
Oh, yeah, so I looked at my scope. Dude, that's a giant effing monkey. I go, I go no, and I, I handed him the scope, and he looked at it. He's like, no way. I'm like, that, I'm like that, that, that can't be a bear. It's too, it's too square. It's like a brick. It's, and it's on two legs the whole time. And it would go, it would pop up 50 yards down where the the trail came out where those mm-hmm. big trees were it would, it would walk around and then it would go back in the trail and pop out next to the trucks where John was this went on for like 20-25 minutes and John was still at the truck John was in his convertible doing a ri- live radio show with Jeff Rents. oh so he wasn't even close but he, but he, he and to keep in mind this is my first night out with Freitas and Jim and Manny you don't know what to expect well, also, you don't want to, you're that guy, you know, like the, you know, you go on those BFR expeditions and this guy's first time, he's like, I've seen one. <laughs> oh, that's right, like, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Guaranteed sighting. So, so I was so glad Eric was with me. And he never went public until just this year. He, was, he came out in the public and was on a Cliff and Mines podcast, Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. He came on and told his story in public for the first time. Wow. Because he's a nurse. He's actually the head nurse at UCSF Pediatrics. So he's so locked in, he's so upper tier management level now nursing that he's untouched. He can't get fired if he says he saw a Bigfoot. Yeah, I remember uh, I had to watch what I talked about for my career as a park ranger. And that's, that's a pretty good story on it. I want to tie you in to my experience with you. And back going back to 2004, when you guys were showing us a good time, we stayed at Fish Lake. Right. And uh, we arrived there. We got set up in our, our campsite. And then we went out and we did our own call blasting, right? Mm-hmm. We had yams with us and, and Osborne. And when we came back, we, there were only one other site occupied by a man and his dog. But we came back, the site directly next to us, had like three major families in it and they were freaking out Remember Loudest, that? they're super rude yeah from eureka and we just like oh there goes the night they're, our whole experience is trashed oh, they were total white trash i second that and they they kept that up to what to midnight-ish do you remember late then i remember all of a sudden we were sitting there i'm like what the hell is that kid doing running between the camps he just came flying down that draw right in between the camps in the pitch black just heavy footfalls bam 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 flying okay so this is a guy me who doesn't really buy into the phenomena he's interested in it and so we set up organic apples in yep. between our sites so uh, remember that people don't put out conventional food you gotta put out organic they don't like the chemicals that's right unless it's like a pastry or something <laughs> yeah or, McDon- pastry. or mcdonald's or, or McDonald's. something yeah but for fruit and produce they don't like they want convent- organic and fresh yeah so so uh yeah, Yams wanted to set that up, so we, we set up the apples. We stacked them up. Actually, we, st- we, we set this up before we left to go do call blasting when we came back. Mm-hmm. But I, if I remember rightly, we had two pyramids of apples. It was just one big one. And then we had a few extra ones that wouldn't stand top, right. and those were cut into little slivers. And they were sit there on, on this on this on this stump that was right between those two sites. I remember it was like a big it was one big pot one big pyramid and then there was a couple of, I don't remember the strips, but I remember there was some on the side. Yeah, because they they wouldn't stay on top, it kept falling off. Right. So they were cut into little pieces. Right. And, and, and around the outsides. Then we took off, did a call blast, we came back, the apples were still there, the campers from hell were there. So after midnight they finally, you know, got quiet. So you and I stayed up, and we were talking yep. about experiences, mm-hmm. and uh, we had we had a table behind us with a lantern, and yep. then we had a fire going, and we're both sitting side by side with the lantern in our back. I had my, my two million candlewatt spotlight in my hand. That's my right. Hand. It was right there. Yeah. And we're sitting there talking, and about two o'clock in the morning, would you say about two ish? It was late. We were the only people up. Yeah, and there's in that it was quiet. We heard a little bit of movement in between, but that's what you expect to hear in, right. in, the, in a forest campground. But thank God, all those campers from hell were, were you know, they, they they were asleep. So we're sitting there, we're talking, and then we hear what sounds like something running between the sites. It ran right through their camps. Stop right there at 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 this this stump scraping sound as it's scraping things off the stump. So you, make, so you make it sound like it was there longer than it was. And then it runs off. It was all instant. It was quick. It was like it stopped, stopped. I mean, it was like a brief pause. It was like a stop. It was like he stopped and got it. It was like whoosh. But it was, it was scraping off the stump. Yeah. But it and got, it was running. But and it, it was yeah. heavy footed. Yeah. It, but it, 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 the way, no human could have grabbed all those apples. It happened fast. 
there's no way a human could have grabbed all those apples and not dropped them. I agree with you. Because we had like a dozen of them. They were stacked pretty good, and the extra ones were cut in because they couldn't fit on top. I think we top. had like 15 total, and there's only one or two left. Right? No, when we went to check, so so here, here's the temptation is we have this super bright light sitting next to us. and you we, want, thought it, we thought it was the camper's kids at first. Yeah, we did. Because, but it happened so fast. It, dude, it was seconds. And we're thinking, there's no way it could be them. So we, we waited, we sat there, and we waited, I don't know, what, 10 seconds? It seemed like forever. And yeah. Then we went to go check it out. We went to check it out, all the sliver pieces were gone. There was one apple on the ground, and there were four left on that four stump. Left. Okay, that's right. So, yeah, because we had put out 15, and I remember thinking like about a dozen were gone. So. Yeah. Maybe 10 were gone. So who has the hand size to run along, scrape those apples off the top, including the cut ones? And it, he didn't stop, stop. It was more like just, it was... Thump, stutter thump. step. It was, yeah, it was like thump, 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 Yeah, so it was a fraction of a stutter step, yeah. just enough to make sure you... Because yeah. I heard the scraping. And it was running fast and pitch black. Yeah, and it disappeared. And that was a, for my first Sasquatch, potential Sasquatch experience. And I don't think it was the campus next door. No way. There's just no way it could be that. Well, then stuff got thrown at the... Dave's trailer, remember the pebbles hitting it all night? Right, yeah. I, I, I would have thrown pebbles at his trailer, too, because he was snoring on and off. That's and right. So my kids went to sleep. Yams went to sleep. You and I finally called it a night. I went to sleep. I went into my tent. And I can hear when uh, Osborne would get up, go to his bathroom, go right. back and forth. It was, it was a quiet night. You can hear these things. And I remember being asleep, and I remember hearing... Right, right. And I thought, my kids are snoring. But it was a weird snore. And when I'm hearing this, too, I'm starting to wake up. And then I feel like I'm being like pushed down on my mat. Right. So I, I force myself to sit up, and I go lean over my kids, still in my bag. And I listen to their breathing, and they're breathing normal. There was stuff around the camp for hours that night. Yeah, and and, and they, they sound normal, but I still hear that. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? So I finish up zipping my bag, go to unzip my tent, and it, it shuts down. It's done. So that was weird in relationship to the apples being took. Right. At Fish Lake, my first Bigfoot outing, technically, and I have this encounter. And I don't know luck, what to say. I, I, it happens to everyone when you first start. Well, for me, it was not beginner's luck. It was... Trained skill and practice. No, it was fucking lots of... Well, with the internet, there was so much more information out. And, yeah. And I probably had... I, I'm sure I had... I look back on it, I know I had other encounters prior to that. But just was, didn't recognize them as such. I didn't know. It, yeah. yeah. And I was supposed to be a Bigfoot, in, you know, hardcore Bigfoot guy. And I didn't even realize the plain as day shit right in front of me. Well, that's all part of the experience which you don't get unless you get it, right? Right, right. Also in 2004, you also, we did that road trip when we stayed at Fish Lake. You, you took me over to Laos camp for the first time. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and you walked yeah, yeah, my yeah, sons yeah. and I up this old, the Bluff Creek Trail. Right. That's closed off now. It's burned off. It's the same place where Roger Bob tried to escape. Right. And they couldn't because of a landslide. But that's all overgrown and closed off. And you took us there. And about three quarters of a mile in, there's a section that's always wet. Right. Okay, and we're walking in, and there are it's no part, footprints. It, it's like it's that section, in case anyone's been there, it's where the, the remnants of the pavement is. Correct. Yeah. The old road bit. Where the big seep right there. And there's several Springs stream crossings. Yeah. yeah. And and I, and you said, yeah, there's a place I go to, and, and, and you find tracks here. So sure enough, we get there, and there are no vibrant soul prints there's no. a bear sign but there's nothing with human vibrant soul prints so we get this place you say yeah this is where i find some tracks and so we're looking at this flooded stone mud pocket area and you say hey check this out we're looking down and what do we find bear footprints footprints it, it, there's a section of, would you say it's about what a good 25 yards -ish? probably something like that yeah. yeah and there's these footprints of uh, if I remember right probably about 7 inches yep. maybe and you can see where something walked deliberately in the mud all the way till it disappeared and there's no other prints there yep and I'm just like holy crap is there a kid or a woman yeah it's, it's 7 inches long and, and that was pretty freaky so that was my 
bobo experience my sons and I got in 2004 when Thank you first you when you first pretty much exposed me to the first signs of the, of the squatching. So that was pretty cool. Right on. Yeah. So we're now going to start eating, but I'll, I say a few more things. We can run through a few more things here, which is pretty good. And and in 2005, finally, is through the BFRL group with Matt Moneymaker, uh, we had this Shelby Car Club group that, that wanted a special uh, Squatch adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. And it was a Thursday, I think. I want to say Thursday or Friday, I can't remember. But what we were doing is we were walking them into this area along this trail. And we had night vision. Um, yep. Some of those guys had Gen 3. We had like Gen 1 and a half. That night day. owls. Yeah, and we couldn't see very well, but that was all part of the fun. And we were in the first group. I was with Mel. Mm -hmm. And we were moving pretty slow. We just couldn't see anything. You guys caught up to us, so you guys passed us up. You, you got in about another 15 minutes past us, and holy hell broke loose. Do you remember that? It was on the way out that it broke loose. Well, you guys had turned around, and you were coming back. Mm -hmm. What did you hear? What was going on? It sounded just like Sierra sounds, Samurai Chatter. It sounded like the mom and two young ones all screaming at us at once to get the hell out of there. On both sides of you? Uh, I think all of it was down... To the left, okay. down the swamp. So you're area. on your way back. You're walking out. So it would be up. I guess on down your left, slope. the swamp. Yeah, yeah, down slope. And uh, I, I remember hearing you guys on the radio. It's almost like you guys were being overrun by by an enemy position. Those guys were freaked out. I wasn't. Yeah. Well, of course you weren't. But, but the, yeah, and they were talking on each other. And oh, it, was, they, it was crazy. And Mel, we thought Mel was recording, and Mel was so excited, and we were we were totally lights out, completely, completely dark. Your mail hit record on his recorder, and he actually hit the power button and turned it off. I've done that before. Oh, everyone has. Yeah, in the in the heat of the moment. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about him. It was just... It happens. It happens. Yeah, it happens. Because you guys came out. We asked what's going on, and you loaned us some of the night vision stuff. We went back in there, and we weren't as fortunate. We heard owls. That was it. And we finished the night out with not too much more. But the next day, we went in there to take a look at what was going on, and... We hiked in there, and that same location, we left the trail, and I found, uh, God, what was it, size-wise? I can't remember now, but was it? 15, 9, and 7. I found a 7-inch size foot impression that would look kind of strange, almost like a posable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really weird. And then it kind of was in the mud down in the area where it was pretty boggy. And then on the other side of that boggy area, you guys found two more size footprints. Mm-hmm. And uh, what were the what, 15 you said? Mm -hmm. And what was the other 12? Nine. Nine. And it's almost like like Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. Mm -hmm. And that was freaky because uh, that was weird. And I think that, it was Mama Bear and two cubs. Well, Mama Bigfoot. Yeah, too. Mama Bigfoot. Yeah. So I wasn't expecting that. You know that was, that caught me off guard too. So I'm looking at this, going, "What is that?" And we're in a swamp. Yeah, it's, it's boggy. I mean, you had to step on objects that weren't submerged, and there's mud tracks. And so whatever it was walked through there and left those impressions, and it was like not what I'm used to seeing. And yep. then, and then, you, you, and then you, you showed me the other ones on the other side of the swamp area, and sure enough, they were very human-like in tracks, and they were big. Yep, barefooted. Yeah, that was a good one, man. That was When those things went crazy coming out, that was... That's still the best stuff I've heard. Well, the intimidation display that what I told you about up in Johnson's. Yeah. That was probably the best I heard because it was two and a half hours of crazy shit. But as far as like hearing like a language kind of style, that's the best I've heard was there. So that's the freaky thing. And and so the show's not over yet. So now Sunday's our day, right? When we do these expeditions, mm -hmm. we send the public away. Sunday's our time. So we, uh, we went up the same trail. We picked an area, I was just up the hill a little bit so we can kind of, you know, relax. Away from the swamp, yeah. Yeah, so we can, you know, not to, listen, yards of... yeah, not to listen to the frogs real close or whatever. And so your specialty was cooking bacon. Oh, yeah. So we cooked bacon, ate the bacon, and maybe we, we even cooked some extra for Mel, gave him some. So we're sitting there half asleep right next to each other. We have, we have like a tarp down. We have like six small... We were all shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, lean to. And, and then we hear what I never expected to hear. Samurai talk coming yep. from the bottom of the swamp area below us 
close enough. I'd say if you were to guess, if you could remember how far away, within 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 50 yards. Is, uh, I remember hearing that within 50 yards. Would that sound, sound about right to you? Yeah, it was close. And we didn't have any night vision or no. It was. It was dark, dark, dark. It was so dark. I heard that. I look over at Bobo and I go, I mouth, what is that? And he, and he mouths back. He doesn't know. And that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was crazy. And so we didn't hear anything else after that. And, and if somebody were to say what the words would, with, with the cadence, it, it was uh, like one asking, hey, can we go over there? And, and something saying, no, you Nick can't. That's the impression I got. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, that that's a pretty yeah fair interpretation of what we heard. I mean, it weren't words word, but the, it, but it was the tone. It was it was how it was accented. It was basically right. Yeah, it was like the night before was just so. That's what stands out to me. That was just so much more intense because it lasted for a solid five minutes. Just. You these little high pitched squeaky voices going, and I mean, how, how do you explain that? I mean, Bigfoots. What in the world mm -hmm. makes noises like that? Sasquatches. They talk about the barred owls making weird stuff. We've heard some weird stuff here. Oh, we heard it last night, owls. but it was nothing like what we heard no. that night. Yeah. And what we heard the night before was closer and way louder. That was, it was, it was crazy stuff. Yeah, like some of those guys was. They went Bigfoot in twice in their life, two nights in their whole life, and they got they got to hear the best thing I heard in over 30 years. Yeah, and now, now they expect it every time they go out. Yeah. So th those are two of the things that, thanks to you, you're with me, that I was able to experience with you. Uh, so guys, I, 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 I took this Ranger out, thought <laughs> I was like a crazy tweaker or something. Now <laughs> you got to hear him, it's awesome. So now you can tell the other Rangers that I'm not a fucking tweaker out there trying to break into cars. That's right, yeah. Because those Rangers up in Prairie Creek thought I was a tweaker. Well, you were there a lot. You're always, you know, out on the yeah. woods. I wonder what you're up to. Yeah, I don't blame. I didn't blame them. I drove shitty cars and old beat up trucks. Looked pretty tweaky, probably. And I, I remember another time you and I were out at Laos camp, and it was 2008. And uh, Bart was there. You were there. Yeah, you, uh, 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 Yams was there. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, and Jamie was there. Uh huh. And uh, my 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 friend, my retired ranger friend, was there. Uh, um, he, he was hanging out, Scotty. Uh -huh. But he went to bed, and so Bart and I are out there, right at the entrance. We're underneath the bushes, hiding, and, and, we're, and we still don't have all the good equipment at this time. 2008. No. It was right before we got good stuff. So. Yeah. So we're, we're sitting there listening. I'm listening to the right. Bart's listening to the left. And then we start hearing something like somebody walking around. Kind of be real quiet, like trying to write up because that's where the old Bluff Creek Trail is that's bermed off, and right. above that is 12 and 10. Right. So that section between 12 and 10, down a steep hillside with the vegetated, with trees, to to that old road, and then we're just down from that at Laos Camp. So we're hearing what is that? We keep hearing some stuff. You guys heard it too, and you guys walk past us on that old road. I don't know if we heard it actually, or well, we heard it, but I, we didn't. I don't think we thought it was a Sasquatch. But you guys went out to go check something. I went to go call down around the bend that goes down where the tracks, those little tracks. We found right, before. right, right, right. I was walking down to the bend to call down that canyon to project my call down there without sort of go a lot further. And then Jamie didn't want. He was complaining about his knee hurt. Oh yeah, my, my, conveniently my knee hurts. It's too dark in there. He gets a little afraid of the dark. Well, it's crazy. You don't know what's out there. So you guys walk past us. We don't say anything to you because I don't even know if you knew we were there. Under the we didn't. We didn't know you were there. We were pretty well hidden. We that's knew why you were out there somewhere. We just didn't know exactly where. Yeah, that's why we were there because it's a great hiding spot. And so you guys walk past us. We don't say anything. You go all the way past, and then you, you got almost to the berm. We did. We were at the berm. And that's when he got, said. He said. Uh, Oh, my knee hurts, bro. I can't keep going. I said, dude, you're such a wuss. And he goes, oh, my knee's killing me. I, I can't walk in the dark like this. I said, dude, we didn't go in. We were like 200 yards. You can see the campfire. If you look, look, look through the bushes and trees, you can see the fire. We're so close. And right then we seen this guy try to cross the trail behind us, like after we had passed by. Like right. it, had, it had been in that little strip, in that little strip of between the creek and the trail, that little right. strip of vegetation. It was in there totally exposed, and we didn't know it. And after we passed it, it went... Well, I'd seen my only daylight 
glimpse of a Sasquatch was there last the year before. Yeah, the skinny one you talked about. <clears throat> yeah. So I didn't realize it at the time until we went later, like when we walked back to where we saw that night. But that thing crossed the trail exactly where that big one went up over the cliff. Went up the same little pathway. Wow. And, and you, 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 I guess before you, when we talked about it, you said you thought it was, you thought it was Bart. Yeah, I thought it was. Oh, we were calling Bart's name for like five minutes. Yeah, and there's no no response, but you you thought it was Bart, and then you find out later it wasn't. We were hiding under the corner. Well, there. once it floated across the trail, we were pretty sure it wasn't Bart. Not floated. I mean, it walked. Yeah. It just glided. Well, it wasn't bobbly or perky jerky at all. Yeah, that, that's that's a crazy stuff at Laos camp. Experiencing that at Laos camp, and. I haven't had much happen to Laos camp because because of the acoustics there, the creek makes noises. You hear voices. Yeah, I hear. Uh, I've heard bass before there. I hear all sorts of crazy stuff. Dude, Laos is the weirdest noisy. The, the way the creek bends around you on both sides, you're in that horseshoe. Right. Then the canyon walls pretty vertical across the creek there. And That's right. It's like a little peninsula. The creek yeah. curves around it. I guess if you wanted to watch campers, you go right on top of that little ridge thing mm-hmm. there, right up above the great swim hole, and just peek down at people and watch the whole show from there. Well, the gnarliest thing that had happened there for sure was one night, it must have been the big male, had to be. Manny and I were in there, and a freaking, we were, it was nighttime, we lay down, we weren't asleep yet, and all of a sudden we just hear, it was like 3.34 in the morning, we just hear, crash, 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 from the cliff across the, the creek there. Right. We just hear crashing, and then, cause sploosh, and just, you just hear this boulder hit the water. Never, it didn't bounce down the cliff, it came flying through the air the whole way. That's, that's, a, that's a long haul. That's yeah. A, yeah. So there's big, and the, dude... The rock's still there. I can't remember which one it is exactly now, but it's one of those three or four of the big ones that are there. But So it hit the water in about four feet, four and a half feet of water. It just hit, and it was like a meteorite hitting. It just displaced all the water, and we heard it hit the dry gravel. And then the whole sploosh of the water came back over it and sprayed, and water flew up. Where we were, there was water on the leaves and the bushes around us. That, that's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. So... Manny slept in his car, and then whenever we went out, there, <laughs> he never slept outside of his truck ever. And he sat, and he had a standard cab, little Toyota. Right. He slept sitting up in the driver's seat every night after that. And Laos is a pretty quiet place. We don't get much going on in Laos. Dude, I haven't had, I had a lot of stuff happen there, but then since that sighting in 2008, I think I've only heard him in there three times. Just knocks and whistles. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking you back to uh, another time. Uh, do you remember Bart's uh, bachelor party? Yeah. And we, we were at this place, yeah, undisclosed location in Scripps National Forest, and we've been there a few days. We were there for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, it's it's really dark. It's I, I'm assuming it's like two ish. It's really real 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 dark. Because I think me and Cliff got there days ahead of you guys. Yeah. I think. You guys were there longer than us. Yeah. Yeah. But you remember the, uh, what sounded like knocking? 65. That was knocking. Yeah, 65 knockings. Across, walked across the freaking mountainside right above us in pitch black, knocking the whole way. And, and, and you, could, you, could, you could tell when it went lower than the edge and right. when it went above it. Yeah. And, and if it was behind something, because the, the, the cadence was the same. I guess the pitch was the same, but, but if you turn away, it changes. But it, it was the same device making the same noise. Would you agree? Right. Yes. And the part I always I makes me curious is, you can't walk along all the trees and hit the trees and get the same sound. So yeah, it, had, it was probably clapping its hands. Yeah, or you think that's another option of that? I, I still say tree knocking when I think it was clapping. Wait, it's still a knocking type sound. I mean, you, yeah, you, yeah. It's if you say, I heard, I heard clapping. You know, it doesn't sound the same as right. a, you know in terms of knocking. But that, that was that's another left me. You know, knocks kind of g- generic for any percussive sound. You yeah. There. So it's not like I've had, I guess I've had several strange things happen when I was with you. Yeah. So maybe you're you're my lucky charm, eh? Not that lucky. <laughs> Never had any luck lately. Yeah, it's been pretty quiet lately. The only vocalization I ever heard in Southern Humboldt was with you at the park you used to work at when we were filming down there. Yeah, Humboldt Redwood. Yeah, back at Humboldt, I, I had some weird stuff happen there. I usually don't talk about it, but um, um, tree knocks. 
I've heard mm-hmm. it twice down there. Once it was search and rescue. We're out all night trying to find these lost people. You know, you get lost, so you climb uphill. I mean, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Anyhow, and and uh, so we found them. And I was just go downhill. Well, that's what these people do. They 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 don't do what they're supposed to. So uh, I was the last guy to leave. I I was packing my quad up, and I was just getting ready to go. I was over by um, uh, Look Prairie. A trailhead because that's one of the major access points to the north part of the park and i was pretty much parked there my quads loaded up and i was getting ready to go and i think i better go recheck it because i don't want my quad, my quad to fall off the back of my pickup truck on the way to the office at 10 o'clock at night That'd be bad. so I, I pretty much just uh go back out to go check it i think i had the engine on and as soon as i got out of the car i heard whack coming from the trees above me mm-hmm. And that was weird. And I waited for more. Nothing more happened. And then fast, uh, fast forward another like four years. And right before I retired, a couple of years before I retired, I was walking in Humboldt, you know, checking on the trails, coming back in late afternoon. And there's a section right after you cross the bridge. It kind of makes a quick double back. Mm-hmm. And I'm walking back and I just passed around one of the big redwood trees. And I hear coming from my left, whack, the same sound coming from a different part of the park up on the side of the hill. Mm-hmm. Of course, I stopped and waited for more action, and then I walked back around the tree looking, and, I, and that happened pretty close. Well, just, I mean, I've talked to almost 20,000 eyewitnesses now, and the amount of people that have seen one carrying a stick or a club is, I can count on two hands. So I always, the question I always have is, how does one make those sounds? Dave Ellis can do it, pops so, his hands. Clapping hands over the mouth. You know, a cup mouth or a cup pants, not in front of your mouth open like a squatch. I'm not doing a good job, baby. Like a dishonest cliff carving. Go ahead. Make your mouth into a. Uh, Go for I, it. I can't really do it right now. Let me see. Get a standing ovation here. And so some Terrible. of the starving, I remember seeing one that with the carving statues has it with the mouth open round, yeah, round. and the hands are like right here to the yeah. side. So that could explain that. Yeah. That's one of those weird stuff like that. Great. Yeah, in 2012, uh, we had our Bigfoot, Bluff Creek Bigfoot film site blowout. Basically, we had Bill Munns come up. We had uh, Prez come up. And they, they haven't been in the, the actual site. So we invited them up. And you were there, too. And you were helping Munns, mm-hmm. uh, redirecting Prez where to go. And it was a good time. You guys also helped us uh, clear out some of the view shed so we can line up the smiley stump with the uh, stag in the background. Mm-hmm. And that was real helpful because that's the frame 352 shot where Roger's, yeah. you know, taking that shot and yeah. Patty's looking over her right shoulder. And right in front of her is the smiley stump. And directly above that smiley stump is the snake. Bo was helping out with the Bill Munns, getting Bill Munns to the film site. Uh, how old is that guy? Uh, he's about 70 now, I think. Or Yeah, he was uh, eight years ago. I think he was 63 then. So yeah. Around 70. Because he was having a little bit of trouble. And that was a long... Yeah, he had some knee problems. Yeah. Back problems. Because that, that's like a, a mile from the parking lot. You go downhill like a half mile. Oh, yeah, that's hit... a... It's, it's a little effort to get there now. Yeah. Well, he got there twice. He got there the first day and the second day. First day, it was kind of interesting to see his reaction to looking at the background trees. And I, I, I was looking at, I'm working on the book thing I'm working on, and I'm looking at some steel pictures. And the, there's one of you helping him across the creek. Uh-huh. Yeah, so he definitely needed the help there. And he was appreciative of all the help he got. And, He's been wanting to get to the film site for a long time. Yeah. The impressive part is he come up with these maps, he come up with these charts, all based on watching the movie footage. And and then when he did the first day, is he pretty much uh, identified the background trees. And the second day, with the help of um, uh, Terry Smith, mm-hmm. mostly, a, he lined up the course with ropes and balloons and uh, those balls. Yeah, the balls. The yeah. same balls you expect to find in the McDonald's PlayStation. Uh, I still got a couple of those balls. Yeah, I got one of those too on my shelf at home. And it, it, it was definitely good times. And you helped us with a lot of the clearing, so the view shed thing. And, um, yeah, me and Cliff showed up. Yeah. I mean, when you guys 
It was quite different looking at that than it was when you guys originally were on that upper sandbar, I'm pretty sure. Because prior to you guys getting there on the, you know, in 2012, uh, it's Ian, yeah, Ian, Stephen, Rowdy, and myself, we did a lot of opening up the view sheds for yeah, the corridors. It was quite noticeable. Yeah, much better. Much better view shed for seeing what's going on. But again, your help was really appreciated, and, and it was good times. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, we all want to know what fucking the numbers are and the answers and what with some real data on it. Yeah. I'm still amazed by the handful of people who don't want to admit uh, that the evidence dictates that their site location is not the correct site location. It's not even debatable. Yeah. But you still you still hear them like, I don't know, how about the massacre theory? You know, he thought it was dead and gone, but... Um, Dude, that's just... That's a whole other level of stupid to believe that. Yeah, it's 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 like there with the flat earth thing. It really that's how I equate it to. Yeah, yeah. Bluff Creek Massacre is equivalent of flat earth. All the suppol data is assumed looking at things that aren't quite right, the coloration of film, it ages, all these different factors and yeah. I know, I've given up and it used to really piss Steven off, you know, to have to deal with it and uh, I guess if if you want to keep your name in the in the in the world, you know, people thinking of you, you got to throw your little crazy ideas out every once in a while right. to keep it going. Yeah, and uh, I uh, change the subject here, but uh, these are my last few questions, and I, I appreciate your patience on this. Is uh, Finding Bigfoot? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how, how many how many episodes did they have? One hundred. One hundred. And when was the first episode? When did it air? Yeah, when did it air? I know you guys filmed it like the year 2011, before. 2011, I guess. Yeah. So you guys actually were... It might have been 2010. I can't remember. But, but you guys pretty much were doing all the shots by 2010-ish. Yeah. We, we met with the producers in 2009 fall. Mm-hmm. We filmed February 2010. We first started filming. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I remember the first one. It's kind of cool in a way where you're watching a show and you know the players mm-hmm. and the friends of yours and, and all the idiosyncrasies you guys do. You're doing them on the show. You know, that's kind of cool. Right. All the human qualities. And I, 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 haven't watched, I haven't watched all of your Finding Bigfoot stuff because we got crappy reception where we live. Right. Yeah, but I, I did watch some and I enjoyed it and it was kind of cool to see you out there. I used to tell people uh, that I, I know Bobo, they used to laugh at me and look like, I sure you do. You need Matt and Cliff too. Yeah, I am like I have to Cliff. All I didn't know was 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 Renee. Uh, and uh, not to embarrass you, Bobo, but Bobo did a really cool thing. Uh, I work for the parks, have for years, and there's this guy who lives in town, and uh, I'll, I'll, I won't mention the name, but he is a big uh, Fighting Bigfoot fan, and uh, I, I end up talking to him from time to time because it's you know it's a park ranger, you do your public relations stuff. And he'd always talk about the different shows, and I would talk about the Bigfoot shows, and, and he'd listen and everything. And I actually told him I, I knew Bobo, and he believed me, which is kind of cool. And um, I knew Bobo was going to be in town one day, so I, I talked to the guy's mom. I says, uh, uh, Bobo, a good friend of mine, is a guy with the Finding Bigfoot show. He's going to be in town, and he's going to come by on this date to visit. And if you can... Uh, um, make sure he's home on that day we want to surprise him she goes okay no problem so a couple weeks go by bobo shows up he swings by the visitor center and makes contacts there and then i drive him down to the trailer park nearby so on the date and time we said we're going to be there i knock on the door and i'm hoping that you know he answers the door but nope his mom answers the door he's down his mom's place She's like, who are you she goes who are you and so what it was is i'm hiding behind the door frame and bobo standing at the front door because i wanted him to answer the door and have right. bobo standing there but mom answers the door and she's kind of looking confused and then i pop around the end and say um remember that day we talked about this is bobo she goes i go where where is where's your son Oh, he, he's, he's, he's taking a nap. I go, could you wake him up? She didn't want to. Yeah, she's a little hesitant. So finally, I go, yeah, we, we kind of set this up. She goes, okay. So she... It was like 11.30 in the morning. Yes, yes, I know. So she invites us in. We're waiting in, in the lobby area, and it's a well-kept house. It's real nice. Yeah. And we're waiting, and it, it takes how long for him to come out? 
a while. He wasn't too excited. No, he, he comes strolling out like he just woke up, you he know. He like hungover or something. <laughs> yeah. And he's standing there, and I say hi, and he looks at me, and then he looks at Bobo, and he looks at me, and he looks at Bobo, he looks at me, he looks at Bobo, looks at me, he goes, no way, no way, no way, no way. And well, he got, I thought he didn't get excited at all. He got excited? Yeah, towards the oh, end. Okay. He's starting, he's like rubbing his eyes, looking at us like, yeah, I remember like him being nonplussed, like. Yeah, what the, what the, who, what, 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 what here? And then finally, he looks between me and you, and me and you, and you, me and you, and speeds up, and then he says, "No way, no way, no way, no way!" He finally recognized That's it was Bobo standing right. there. Yeah, and you guys, we chatted for probably about what thirty minutes because you had yeah. to go. Yeah, we talked about crazy things like uh, mermaids and shows. And <laughs> oh, he was convinced I was real. Yeah, it was kind of it was fun. We had a good time with it, and, and we left. And I, I was and I really appreciate you doing that. That was that was great. Oh yeah, that was no big deal. Yeah, um, yeah, but you know you do have fans out there, and and it's it's you always go above and beyond to make them happy. And I I, I, I learned that from Gimlin. Yeah, that's that's a great and Bob, teacher. And Bob Saget. Oh, Bob Saget. Those guys are so good at the public. They're, I just can't believe how they, Bob Gillen, I mean, I get sick of telling my stories. He's told the same one story for 50 freaking years. Right. And he tells it every time, like it's the first time he told it. I enjoy watching him. He's Yeah, uh, he's I saw a, Saget spend eight hours signing autographs. Eight hours. Dude, on the res up in Washington, he just signed, wow. signed, 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 signed. Everyone got one. And people were calling their relatives to come from the next town down, two towns down, come down. All the natives up there were like, because, you know, the Olympic Peninsula in the wintertime. Right. Stormy weather. You're just stuck inside watching satellite. So those guys, they're definitely, they're definitely up on the TV. There are a lot of TV watchers out there on the peninsula. <laughs> so they, uh, they were super excited to see Bob. Saget, and I was always like, "Dang man, those guys are so gracious to everyone." Like, if anyone ever comes up to talk to me like that, I should try to be the same way. Well, you have to be. I, you got a lot of good feedback. You have a big fan base that really enjoy watching you. Yeah, and that's the other thing is like I always think like, uh, it's all edited. They don't, you know what I mean? It's just because you're talking on a box in their living room. It's like, it is totally skewed. Mm -hmm. Just how the network presents it, whatever. Well, going back to the Bob Saget show, you were on one of the episodes, weren't you? Yeah. On your birthday. Yep. And they gave you what? A couple of cases of beer and a samurai sword. And a samurai sword. And what did you do with that samurai sword? Played with it. <laughs> Didn't you cut a few things up? Oh, we were chopping it up. Yeah. And then um, Flippy was a ninja student. Flippy was there for that. And uh, so we were getting, he wanted, he always had a dream of a picture of him piggybacking on a Sasquatch as a ninja with Bob Saget watching. And so I filled in for the Bigfoot, <laughs> loaded my back with a samurai sword, and we ran by Bob Saget. And it was a life dream come true. Yeah. Actually, earlier when I interviewed about Bart, he talked about the episode with the, the samurai sword. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was. That was, that was the first time I saw Moneymaker lose his mind. <laughs> oh. He went bat shit crazy. Oh, are you, you mind sharing on that? or? Oh, dude, he was just drinking Red Bulls and eating these German diet pills that, as far as I could tell, were like some low-grade amphetamine. And he just lost his mind and just... It was my shoot. Like, they were shoot, they were filming with me, like, Bob. Yeah. And I, I just... They, they didn't want me to bring anybody. And I, I invited the whole BFRO. I brought, like, just whoever was in Washington, you know. Well, I didn't invite, Moneymaker invited the whole BFRO, put it on the on the list, and like I think 70 people showed up or something crazy. Wow. And they they didn't they only wanted to deal with me, and they said, like, <laughs> bring, I said I gotta bring my buddy Cliff. And they're like, oh, okay. And I said, well, we're actually. <laughs> I said I want to do I want to be doing an expedition in Washington. Let's go do that. Like let's go up there. Went up there, and then Moneymaker just totally tried to take over the whole thing, and like he was winding up wires and cables and hanging around the it was when Derek and Wally first bought that research center up in Washington yeah up in the Olympic Peninsula by Lake Crescent freaking the guy had been like a telephone repairman or something, some kind of electrician or something he had tons of wire and my maker literally was up till 4.30 in the morning cranking 80s music on this booming series rattling the windows dude like with 
30 or 40 people that couldn't sleep. <laughs> and him just running around like crazy, coiling wires and hanging them on the walls. He goes, it makes us look professional. I was like, dude, this guy's losing his mind. And then, <laughs> then Bob showed up and the crew. And when we go, like, I was supposed to be like the host, you know? And yeah. he just like tried to take over and like, oh, no, this is my scene. And I was like, what the, because I'd never seen him like that before. Right. And it was like a preview of things to come in the first couple of seasons <laughs> of Finding Bigfoot. Uh, entertainment. Oh, that was classic. I just remember hearing the car ripping into the radio going, money here's going nuts. And <laughs> And all of a sudden, we, we, we could hear miles away going up the canyon, just wah, wah. And then the classic was they couldn't get a hold of the car in front of them. And one of the guys there for hearing the radio. He goes, someone stop them. If no one can stop them, I will. And then we just heard the whole canyon, like, reverberating with the engine revving. Wah. <laughs> and then next thing you know, we hear, like, Derek's throwing Matt out of the car and not letting him drive and Saget's freaking out. And he was in the car, though, with this is all going on, right? Yeah, I was like, Derek, Saget, <laughs> Money, and I forget who else. Yeah, the, the producers were kind of pissed. They were like, who's this whack job, like, running around? And he just kept drinking Red He never stopped taking Red Bulls and his diet pills. And just freaking, freaking out. He thought it was all about him and oh, tried yeah. to try to try to toy toy try to take over the whole thing and so I have to do it. So, so when the public watches it, they see it's a BFRO thing, they it's not Bobo giving us a bad name, it's me giving us a good name. I'm like, I don't know how how good you came across. <laughs> yeah. all jacked up on Red Bull fucking being a weirdo. Yeah, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah. Well, I just got a few more questions for you. I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Yeah, and um, your favorite places to Sasquatch. What is your favorite place to Sasquatch? And what was your best encounter? On the show? Yeah, let's go with the show. There's too many good places to say favorite. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, UK was amazing, awesome, just mind-blowing trip. There's no squatches, so that was... Not Squatch, but it was a great trip. And is that the one where you wore the kilts? Yeah. And the mosquito infested place? Mosquitoes and worse. Midges. Midges are way worse. Uh, They're kind of like nose teams, but worse than those. But Nepal with Himalayas was awesome. Vietnam was unbelievable. That place. But there you're not. You're wasting your time if you're looking for a wild man in Vietnam. There you're not. It's a 10 day hike to get out into the mm -hmm. into the wildlands where they may still be. Um, but it's pretty much jungle. It's thick and yeah. Indonesia kind of sucked. Would that be under like the worst place to go? For international, probably Indo is the least hospitable, and people were people were amazing, and there was some beautiful, beautiful stuff to see. But I mean, compared to non, well, in, in uh, Indo, we were like almost three weeks out in the middle of. We were way out. We didn't see any other white people the whole time we were out there, and it was. Like, it was pretty, but, um, yeah, it was just kind of, yeah, the food was bad, um, the, everything was just kind of nasty, like the house we stayed in was kind of gross, and it was actually like a mansion, but it was just, in the tropics, all musty and mildewy mm. and moldy, and it was a, a famous general, Indonesian general's house. So it was this big spread, but it was just like we we're just sleeping on wood floors, and it was it was, it was rough. Very cultural of, for you. Lot, uh, the people were awesome. Everyone we met in Asia was awesome, except for China. We went to China. Everyone was lame, dude. Like they were just so rude and aggressive and pushy. And until we got out in the country, then the poor people that all the Chinese the Chinese looked down on, like the, their version of rednecks, whatever mm -hmm. country folk. They were awesome, just super warm and welcoming. And then, but in the city, everyone was just—I guess it's just a function of being in super crowded places. Like the, the whole, the whole country was like the worst of New York attitude. That was all of China when you're in anywhere near the cities, yeah. or in, or even in the country with city people. Because we were like in a really big tourist spot, so there was when we were at the park. So there was a lot of Chinese, city Chinese up there that were lame and then the locals were super cool and in Indo most beautiful warm welcoming people in the world 
by the way, that's the biggest Muslim country in the world. And we, we didn't even see anyone raise their voice when we were there mm -hmm. for three weeks. We didn't, see, we didn't see one argument the whole time we were there with anyone in the whole country. That's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, they were really chill. Vietnamese, the people were spectacularly warm and welcoming, love Americans, couldn't believe that. I flew over there on my flight. I had uh, two Vietnam vet guys and they're wearing their Vietnam veteran hats. And I was like, oh shit, these guys are gonna, fuck, these guys are burning babies alive with napalm and shit. Like that, that's how I was thinking of how the Vietnamese saw it. You know, mm -hmm. we went over there and bombed their country and killed over 2 million people. So, I mean, I thought, dude, these guys went over there and just raised havoc and they couldn't have, I was shocked. And then I ended up being on the, same shuttle with them to the airport. We stayed at the same hotel. We're staying like whatever the Beijing Hilton, or that, or yeah, the Beijing Hilton. So they ended up going to the same place, and I ended up going on a tour. I got there early before the rest of the team. Yeah. And uh, I took a tour of military sites. It was a four-day tour of Vietnam War, or as they call it, the American War. Is that like, is that like a, a, a scheduled program that they do? Yeah, yeah. It's like a tour, like DMVN Phu huh. and the Hanoi Hilton where McCain, John McCain was locked up and tortured and the, all the military museums and we went to Hue City where the Tet Offensive happened and got to go in some of those underground, I, I couldn't even fit, I could only go in the main big hospital rooms and stuff like that but they took us in the Tunnel Rats. Yeah, yeah, so it sounds like it was kind of cool seeing the different countries. Oh yeah, of course. Now, now I gotta ask you, uh, best evidence? while you're out and about, what was the best evidence? Well, we found had? out that the production company wasn't even handing in our samples to get tested. Oh? They'd say, uh, and they'd never give us a straight answer what happened to the mm. hairs or DNA or, we didn't find a whole lot of stuff anyways. I mean, Cliff found those prints in Georgia. Um, I found prints in New Mexico, they were in snow and they were Melt, melting out already. There was no definition. It was just, you can see they were like six, seven foot step and 18 inch, but you know, snow tracks. So, but it was cold. It was freezing up there. So it wasn't like it was melting out all the time. It was pretty consistent because it was, I mean, it was below zero at night and stuff. But enough to melt a little bit to change the shape. The shape no, it was still foot shape. It just, there was no detail. Okay. Like the toe. You, you can't tell toes. <clears throat> there was no toes. Yeah. And then, Best evidence. We, we could have had amazing vocals, but that was another squatcher's luck up in Washington mm. or Oregon season season one, and then also season one of Washington Silver Star Mountain episode. The audio guys were just happy to be just, we're like on the side of a mountain, we're on a right. wide road, enough for two logging trucks to pass. And they were up against the mountain on this side, and we were out on the road edge where it dropped off down to the next level. And coming up from there is where we heard the the samurai chattering, two of them talking back and forth, like just casually, they were walking along below us, just walking along, mm -hmm. talking. Then Moneymaker yelled at them and they stopped. <laughs> what, was that similar to what you and I heard that one time? Yeah. Yeah. But more conversational. Yeah. Not scolding, but more like. There's like two dudes talking. There's like two guys on speed, like just talking way faster and the cadence is what, what really sets it up and it goes duh, 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 duh. yeah like, a, like a conversation yeah but it's like a herky-jerky <sighs> yeah mr nelson he, he was doing a, a linguistic study he said he slowed it down and you know mm. some of the the samurai talk he slowed it down and it sounded more like words and phrases and everything so yeah there's phenoms well i got my last question for you not not the end on a bad note but what were the, some of the worst places to go to squatching? We you're all agreed the worst spot was Kansas by far was the the worst one for sure. Why? What? Why is that? It was freezing cold. There's not much squatches there. They just pass through. It was just that it was freezing. It was flat. I mean, it's Kansas. It's flat and ugly. No topography. It was just we never barely saw any sun. It was just gray and howling north. It never dropped below 20 mile an hour winds due north Arctic vortex. It was all kinds of record low temperatures set while we were there for that those dates in yeah. history. We were there for like 
for the nine days we were there, five of them were the coldest ever recorded for those days. Yeah, just the luck, right? And, and the worst evidence that you guys come up with? I mean, that's kind of a silly question to ask, but... It was my photo. <laughs> which, which, yeah, which one was that? I didn't see all the, the episodes, but... Uh, it was a photo of Bobo's backyard. Oh, yeah? Where some asshole went and messed up my picture. <laughs> Say there was a reflector in the background. Oh, somebody, somebody we know? Yep. Is he, is he standing behind me as we speak? No, he's sitting next to me talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, Leiterman. Uh, I got a friend of mine called me. Oh, goes, I, I used to. Oh, I, I, about the photo. I remember that one. Okay, I'll let you talk about it. Go ahead. I get a call from my buddy up in Willow Creek, and he's in the Bigfoot stuff, and he's like, hey, dude, my chicks, my wife's friends, cousin. He's got Bigfoot photo. He saw a Bigfoot down the avenue of the Giants. I'm like, what? And I tried calling that for a couple of weeks, and he wouldn't get back to me. And I was, I tracked him down, went down, found where he lived, showed up down there. He's like a nice guy. And um, this is one that's really, this is the one that really made me way more skeptical. He was hemming and hawing, and yeah. didn't want to, didn't want to, you know, anything to do with it. And, and then I made them, now I know why people say don't do that. I said, I'll pay you to take me there and show me the photo. And he did. And I bought the photo off him so that we could use it on the show. So I paid him. It was going to be 500 bucks. I gave him 250 down. And I was like, that's worth it to me just not to leave my house for an yeah. you know, episode at home. That's awesome. So I paid him half and then went to this location where he described... Where it walked down and jumped over the log like something big on two legs had come down, jumped over the log. You see where it swiped off the the redwood needles, and yeah, and you can see where it walked and slid down the hill. And I'm like, well, that's right where he said. And he said he just stayed over here and never walked over there. Right. So I was like, oh man, this is like a toy seer or something on two legs came down here. That's all. And like, not knowing the guy's lying. And then <laughs> later on, when I found out. <laughs> Right when we went to go film, I, I saw him one more time. He never, because he didn't show up at the town hall. He didn't show up for the recreation or anything. Yeah, he had no driver's license. Did you guys ever pick him up? And... Yeah. Yeah. Did he ever come on camera? I can't remember now. Uh, I think he was interviewed on camera. You, I don't, yeah. you know, to be honest, I don't remember. I don't remember. Because he said, he said, he goes, well, maybe I wasn't seeing stuff too good because I had just gone to bed in three weeks. And then it was... Then I found out the guy was a total tweaker. He'd been on, he'd been high on meth forever. He'd quit right before I got a hold of him, like mm. two weeks before. So he'd been, when I met him, he was normal, seeming clean. Then right. he started using again and just flipped out. And he was using again when we started filming. That's he was good. back on the gag. Gosh. Because I actually got to meet him because. Well, yeah, because I couldn't, the other thing was that I swore, I gave an oath. But I wouldn't tell you he was out poaching Burl. That's right. Yeah, we had that problem in the park. Yeah, and so I, I swore to him, I said, dude, because that's one thing I always, because up in Humboldt, man, I was like, there's so many outlaws, and there's so many, especially back before you could just grow in your backyard. Right. When all the growers had hidden patches out in the forest, like the more remote, the better. And, you'd, you know, everyone hiking up their spots at night to avoid detection. Guys had, the pot growers had 90% of the encounters out here. So I, uh, my motto is always like, I'll never say nothing to the cops. If, if you tell me, I'll just stick to Bigfoot. I don't care what else you're doing. <laughs> yeah. As long as it's not a child pornography ring. Right, yeah. Then, then when I found out he was a tweaker and lying, and he, has, and he ripped me out for that money for the picture, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm telling Letterman the guy's a poacher. <laughs> yeah, I'll go find him. Because if I remember rightly, I, I was actually the film, sk- film, uh, film site got uh yeah, you're the monitor part. yeah 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 so i was there when you guys were filming and i was watching you guys do the show and robert went out there and found out that it was a stump and not a bigfoot uh, uh yeah well a green stump and then now that i look back well i look at it now and i'm like of course it's a stump but back then i was like believing him so i'm trying right. to see i'm seeing what he's telling me he's look he goes well you can't tell it in this picture but with the naked eye i can see i mean i can see the eyes and blinking and i was like oh okay and yeah, that's one thing about finding Bigfoot. It's made me a lot more... Skeptical? 
way more, witnesses? way more skeptical, way more. I used to believe everybody pretty much. Like, I used to believe 99.7% of the people. I thought maybe three out of a thousand were, well, besides the ones that were obviously lying or yeah. joking or just saying stupid shit. Like, oh, yeah, I saw Bigfoot. Yeah, look like my mother-in-law. Oh, if I hear one more of those. <laughs> look like my husband. Look like my mother-in-law. Oh. Well, in, in your defense, a little bit that that picture was cropped. You couldn't tell too much, and 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 it, it, the background was kind of out of focus. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, it didn't stop you from figuring it out. That's because I'm outside looking in. You were pretty much inside looking out. Exactly. That's the problem. When you're too like uh, working on the, the, this book. I'm working on the book. Yeah, when you want something to be true, yeah, you'll you'll it, bend stuff in your mind to make it fit. And you'll make true. it work perfectly. Yeah. That's why you bring in somebody else to finish your editing for you. Or when you get it done, you okay. How does this look? You know, mm -hmm. being dyslexic, I turn letters around. I'll never see the right. They looks good to me. And then somebody right away steps up, and goes, "That's not how you spell that." So. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to interview you. We go way back, yeah, uh, 1999. So out of all my swatching all friends, millennia. you were the first swatching friend, and, and you still and you still even talk to me, which is pretty cool. And I thank you very much for your time on this, and thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me, Robert. Yeah, because we are in the middle of the, not the wilderness, we're in the middle of the Six Rivers National Forest. Ain't nobody for miles around, and there's just three of us here, and it's a quiet night, and it's. And it's cooler than last night. Last night was pretty. Yeah, warm. we can safely say there's no one with at least no one within at least a four mile radius. Yeah, I, I would concur to that. Yeah, there's nowhere foreign to be. Yeah, not counting not counting the bears or the squatches or the uh, foxes. Yeah, actually, therm wise, we watched the fox a couple of nights ago. That was pretty pretty cool. Yeah. Watching us. Other than that, it's been pretty quiet. Deer, foxes. We saw a turtle when we drove up. A uh, western pond turtle in the middle of the road. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and it's been nice spending this quality time with you, and I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you so much.